sponsored by Squarespace. The skies above the Korean War crackle to life as a new jet enters the fray. Long in shape and with three powerful engines, it roars across the sky. Its belly rotates open and several bombs launch out to meet their targets, like an alien mothership spawning drones. And as it turns its sights on enemy aircraft coming to intercept, it blasts them apart with eight machine cannons. The future has arrived, and it's American. You might think that I'm being very dramatic in today's video, but it's rather fitting because today's aircraft actually became a movie star, appearing in a film of the era as a futuristic new fighter jet of the US Air Force. In real life, it was faster than its piston-powered forebearers, and it would also be the herald of a new era of aviation. It seems that everything was going for this attack bomber, fame, fortune, and a potential order of 300 units, till it all crushed down to Earth. What happened, and why did the jet of the future fail? This is the Hollywood story of yesterday's forgotten future, the Martin XB-51 attack bomber. It's 1946 and while World War II is over, the race to build the future jet-powered air force has just begun. It was a race that the United States couldn't afford to lose, especially against the new rising power of the USSR. Thus, in the fall of the very same year, the Air Force started a competition to design a new jet-powered bomber aircraft. It would have to have the following requirements. It would be a rapid ground attack aircraft, for low-level bombing and close support missions. The basic mission would be 4,000 pounds of explosives and have guns for close quarters. It would have a 1,000 nautical mile range and have a pressurized cockpit to fly at high altitude. Martin responded with the jet-powered Model 234, a formidable 70,000-pound aircraft capable of carrying 8,000 pounds of ordnance over 800 miles. It would have two jet engines and two turboprops. You're probably asking yourself, why did it have two types of propulsion? That's because jet engines in 1946 were still very early technology and not trustworthy. Initially declared the victor of the competition, the Model 234 was rechristened as the XA-45, the A standing for attack, because this was a ground attack aircraft, something that the Air Force would actually drop in the very next year. But that wouldn't also be the only thing the Air Force would change. Following the selection process, the US Air Force redirected their focus towards speed, prompting a comprehensive overhaul of all programs, including the XA-45, which was originally conceived without prioritizing this attribute. Simply put, the Martin XA-45 was too slow. So the model unveiled in February of 1947 underwent such extensive modifications that it bore little resemblance to its predecessor. Transformed into a new lighter 52,000 pound variant, this reimagined XA-45 now boasted three engines and incorporated such innovative features such as a swept wing and tail, a rotating bomb bay, and notably, bicycle landing gear, a technology previously pioneered by Martin as part of their XB-48 initiative, which is totally a future video on that channel coming very soon, so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already. Sufficiently impressed by all this, the military ordered two prototypes as part of a fixed price contract worth around 9.4 million US dollars, which is actually 128 million today. Boy, talk about inflation. Which covered everything from wind tunnel tests, mock-ups, prototyping, the tools to build it, spare parts, drawing, technical data, and even the test pilots. Cha-ching! But Martin would throw in a new name for free the XB-51. And this is what they came up with. I have a question for you. Does more engines mean better aircraft? What about in other areas of life, like online business? Imagine how unstoppable online you would be with an engine-powered website. The fluid engine, that is, from Squarespace, today's video sponsor. 
Now, whilst it's not made for aircraft to fly, the Fluid Engine's impressive drag-and-drop technology makes making a website a breeze, including one for both mobile and desktop, it does it automatically. Plus, with Squarespace, there are actually hundreds of templates to choose from, including some that have an online store set up and ready to go. You've just got to add products. Or others that can launch a business idea in an instant with marketing tools set up to go. Now, I bet you're like, I love you, Found and Explained, but what has Found and Explained done for me lately? Haha, <laughs> as if the weekly videos weren't enough. Well, I'm not empty-handed. I can also give you 10% off your first site and domain on Squarespace at www.squarespace.com found. Anyone who clicks that link also gets my gratitude, a warm, friendly hug, and a special thanks for making everything that you watch possible. So click that link down below. Renowned for its sleek, elongated fuselage, earning it the moniker, the flying cigar, the Martin XP-51 emerged as a medium bomber amidst the backdrop of the Cold War. The first thing you'll notice is the three General Electric J-47 engines, an unusual number for a combat aircraft, with two underneath the forward fuselage and pods, and one at the extreme tail with the intake at the base of the tail fin. This would give it some serious speed, and three engines would provide enough redundancy that if anything were to go wrong with it, it would be able to make an emergency landing. Plus again, this new jet technology was rough. These engines would give it a top speed of 644 miles per hour and a cruise speed of 538 miles per hour, damn fast compared to the bombers that came before. But that's not all. It also had four sub 1,000 pound thrust rocket assist takeoff bottles with a 14 second burn duration that could be fitted to the rear fuselage to improve its takeoff performance, making it take to the skies in an impressively dramatic way. Although the wings were unusually thin, they were still able to house multiple mechanisms such as the leaning edge anti-ice heating, automatic slats, full span slotted flaps, and an advanced spoiler aileron which enabled extraordinary roll control. On board, there would be a crew of two comprising of a pilot and a navigator, with the pilot in a bubble fighter jet style canopy, whilst the navigator had a tiny little window to the rear of the pilot. Nice and cozy. Both would be in a pressurized air conditioned environment equipped with upward firing ejection seats. This wouldn't be the first time they were implemented into an aircraft, but it was the first Martin jet with an escape plan. Although much later in the story, you'll see that it wasn't used much. When it came to weapons, Martin bought forward the same rotating bomb bay from the XA-45, but the bombs could also be carried externally up to a maximum load on the aircraft of 10,400 pounds easily 700 kilos more than the mission requirements. There would also be eight 20 mm cannons mounted in the nose for any dogfights or to target lighter ground targets. The initial wooden mock-up of the XB-51 underwent scrutiny by the Air Force in February 24th of 1948. Following this assessment, Glenn Edwards, a promising test pilot, was designated to spearhead the flight evaluations. However, tragically, just two months later, Edwards would lose his life during the test flights of Northrop's YB-49 Flying Wing, which we've got a video here on the channel. So just before the test flights, they had to swap in a new pilot, Pat Tibbs, who was called up to assume his responsibilities. And thus, the XB-51 took to the skies for the first time on October 27th in 1949 with Tibbs at the controls. He was able to fly it for 38 minutes with some impressive flight dynamics and hitting some mock dive bombing runs without issue. Just in time for the real thing to be required in the Korean War. Yes, it's that time again and the United States have found itself fighting back in Asia. Politics of the time aside, it was actually an opportunity for the government to look at replacing its now aging fleet of piston-powered bombers, specifically the Douglas A-26s, with jet-powered ones. Just what is your mission? Quality. Flying hardware of better quality than the enemy. Not just the aircraft, but the power plant, the armament, the radar, everything that goes with the vehicle to make up a complete weapon system. And wouldn't you know it that the Martin XB-51 was the perfect candidate. 
Thus, the United States Army Air Force, they were still one thing back then, organized a competition and invited Martin with the XB-51, as well as North American's AJ-1 Savage, as well as the Avro Canada CF-100 and the English Electric Canberra for a potential production contract of 300 units. The XB-51 and the Canberra would emerge from this competition as the favorites and went head to head. While initially appearing to hold the advantage with its impressive speed, the XB-51 ultimately faced defeat against the Canberra. Despite its slower pace, the Canberra's lower wing loading provided with the desirable range and superior maneuverability at low altitudes, qualities sought after by the judges to operate in Korea. Furthermore, while the XB-51 could only linger over a target 400 miles away for an hour, the Canberra could extend its presence for two and a half hours over a target located 900 miles away from its base. Additionally, the general strength of the XB-51 airframe was relatively low and would prevent it doing tight turns whilst fully loaded with fuel. Lastly, the tandem main gear plus outriggers of the XB-51 were thought to be unsuitable for the requirement to fly from emergency forward airfields. Yikes. This decisive victory for the Canberra swiftly dashed any hopes for a production version of the XB-51, illustrating that speed alone was not enough to secure success in the competition. Although the XB-51 itself wasn't chosen for acquisition, Martin was tasked with manufacturing 250 Canberras under license, designated as the B-57. Additionally, Martin's rotating bomb bay design would be integrated into the production models of the B-57. There was also a proposal for a super camera, which would include features from the XB-51, such as the swept wings and tailplanes, offering improved speed and performance compared to the original B-57. However, this advanced aircraft never progressed beyond the conceptual stage. The extensive modifications required would have demanded a significant amount of time for implementation and testing before it could enter production, rendering it unfeasible in time for the Korean War. So whatever happened to the XB-51 from here? Throughout the remainder of its development, the XB-51 served as a critical test platform offering insights into groundbreaking technologies that would eventually find their way into other aircraft, notably the English Electric Canberra. During its idle time, it also made an appearance in the film Towards the Unknown as the Gilbert XF-120 fighter, which is always fun when Hollywood makes an experimental fighter or bomber and turns it into something that the Air Force has fleets of. Although if it had gone their way, there would have actually been 300 XB-51s in the Air Force. At Edwards Air Force Base, which was actually named after the same test pilot who died flying that flying wing, they started doing additional tests. In 1951, engineers focused on understanding the dynamics of a bomb release at high velocities, a pivotal aspect of aerial warfare. This research reached a critical juncture on March 21st when an unexpected incident unfolded mid-flight. At an altitude of 15,000 feet, the right-hand aft door unexpectedly opened, resulting in a dangerous surge of air pressure that led to the dislodgement of a critical component, causing it to fragment and damage engine number two, which is one of the reasons why its underslung forward engines were actually one of the largest flaws. This would compound only six months later when on May 9th, 1952, the second prototype crashed during a low altitude high speed maneuver at Edwards Air Force Base. The aircraft, which was piloted by Major Neil Lathrop, unexpectedly inverted during an alien roll, leading to a catastrophic collision with the ground, resulting in a fatal explosion. The challenges then continued when the first prototype built met a similar fate on March 26th in 1956, during a ferry flight from Edwards Air Force Base. Witnesses reported a premature stall during takeoff from El Paso Municipal Airport, causing the aircraft to lose altitude rapidly after reaching a nose-high position. Despite attempts to recover, the XB-51 struck a boundary fence and ultimately disintegrated upon impact.
Although the ultimate fate may have been overshadowed by these tragedies, with both prototypes meeting untimely ends, the legacy of the XB-51 lives on. Its contributions to aeronautical engineering and the lessons learned from its trials continue to shape the future of aircraft design and operation. And we can appreciate that it's a fascinating time capsule into the beginning of the jet age, where engineers really thought that anything was possible. Thanks so much for watching today's video. I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to click on the side and subscribe. And if you like this, leave a little comment down below so it helps the algorithm.